All right, so uh, the topic is quite provocative, so I want to make sure you're friends with each other at the end of this session. So I'd like you to spend uh, just one minute at your table to talk to your partners about what do you do, what is your remedy when you get a hiccup? You know what a hiccup is, right? So what's your remedy? You got one minute. I will be asking for one or two people to share their remedies with us. So, that was your minute. I'd like to hear one or two people share a very unique remedy that they have tried or they sincerely believe that it works. Please shout it out, yes? Take thumbs, right, the tablets. Awesome, what else? Okay, yeah, one more. Yes? Dry martini. Dry martini, that's a remedy to most problems. Right? So uh, here's how I want to summarize my entire talk in the next two minutes or less. Hiccups, we don't know why they happen. We know what happens when you have a hiccup. It's a diaphragm, it's convolusing. And then we don't know what actually solves the hiccup. There is no scientific proof around it. Most of the evidence that people share is anecdotal. If you actually collect your own data of how many times you are able to solve your own hiccups, using the remedy that is passed on to you from generations, you might find some surprising results. What is most surprising about this entire phenomena is that no one will choose not to do anything. Yeah, that's the same problem with our organizations. <laughs> our organizations have occasional hiccups and their remedy is asking for estimates. It doesn't actually solve the problem but it gives them something to do. <laughs> now, this talk is very dense. Uh, I would like to invite questions, but the hour that I have, I've broken this talk into two main parts. So I'll open up for questions uh, midway, and then at the end, hopefully leaving about 10 minutes so we can kind of process all the information and get the questions out. So I'd like, you, like your participation in this one. Now, how many of you smile when you give an estimate? How many of you smile when you ask for an estimate? <laughs> See, this is what puzzles me, is when two people involved in an activity are not smiling, most likely frowning, why do you still choose to do it? Yeah, even Zoltar or uh, Elvis does not smile when it gives you an estimate. There's an excellent book, uh, The Hofstadter's Law states that it always takes longer than you expect, even when you take into account uh, The Hofstadter's Law. There are two things that are certain about estimating. You will always be wrong. You will spend more time estimating that you could have used to do the work instead. Agile estimating doesn't exist. You look at the agile values, you look at the agile principles, the word estimate or estimating does not occur even once. It's a practice that people have adopted and they have adopted very rapidly. And that is what has puzzled me for a long time. I actually adopted a lot of estimating practices until I paused to take a look at what was really happening. We all understand that estimates are guesses. Sometimes they are intelligent guesses. Sometimes you spend time building consensus within your team of experts, but at the end of the day, it is still a guess. If estimates 
were accurate, we would be calling them facts. <laughs> so the core essence about an estimate is it's always a guess, no matter how you come about it. There are two main approaches people use in terms of coming up with estimates. One is an expert judgment-based estimation technique where people who have worked in the domain or on the technology platform are asked for their opinion, and we look for differences in opinion. Planning poker is an activity like that. And then you try to get more information based on this difference of opinion, and you base an estimate on top of that. Other ways of approaching estimation is to use the statistical analysis-based approach, where you're gathering empirical data and evidence, where you're assuming that your reference class for tomorrow is going to be like the reference class for today and yesterday. What that means is I am going to be working in the same platform, the same domain, same technology, and similar challenges will happen tomorrow as they happened yesterday or, or in the past. There are stuff that we know. There is stuff that we know we don't know. And then there is stuff that we don't know that we don't know. Trying to estimate is trying to put a measure on your ignorance. <coughs> How do you put a point on it? <laughs> what is really difficult in our organizations is to admit that I don't know. It is much better preferred that you make up some BS theory, right? And when you do that, you sound intelligent and you are more convincing. But at the end of the day, you're still lying because the truth is you don't know. When you start the project, you know the least about the project. When you've finished and shipped the project, that's the time when you know the most about this project. So when you're estimating, that's the dumbest point in your life on that project. <laughs> Why would you do that? There is a fallacy, and Daniel Kahneman and Amir Travisky, uh, they've written this awesome book. Uh, Daniel Kahneman wrote it after he got the Nobel Prize in 2002. He's a behavioral economist, and he tries to explain the planning fallacy. And all the research that he did kind of leads us to this, is when people are asked to think in detail about how they want to plan and finish a task, there is an even greater tendency to underestimate the duration of the task. For this, I wanted to expose a lot of biases that have been researched in the industry and I'm trying to provide references in the slides. Uh, there's a slide share, so you can go to slide share and you'll find almost the same set of slides over there. But one of the research is done by Simula Labs in, by Jorgensen is that the confidence that the estimators have in their own estimate is unjustifiably high. And there is a large precedence of anchors. What anchors in behavioral thinking is a piece of information that you will latch on to when faced with a lot of uncertainty. One of the ways you try to avoid anchors is when you do planning poker, you are asking all of your team members to vote at the same time. But that's just one instance of an anchor being taken care of in that meeting. What about that coffee room conversation where your CEO walked into the team member and said, this should be an easy project? What about that hallway conversation where someone walked in and planted a seed that we've never delivered this before? You are already anchoring a lot of people, and you can't control the exposure that you have to the anchors in your own organization. This is a study that was done in 2005. In the three graphs, there were three different groups of people who were asked to estimate a project when they actually knew how long it took to deliver the project. For the first team at the top was told that the project would take roughly more than about 20 months. That was the anchor that was planted for them. And then for the second team, it was the third team, it was told that it is about two months. So you can see that statistically, the anchor has a significant effect on what you planted into your team's memory or in your team's understanding. The middle graph is for a team that was not given any anchor. They were most closer to the actual it took to do the project in the past. Estimation is often treated as a sign of competence. If you are a lead in a team, providing a lower estimate is an ego issue. In fact, if you don't provide an estimate, then your competence will be put into question. So I rather pretend that I know everything because now you are putting me in a spot where I have no way out. Your estimate is gonna implicate you. 
the kind of estimate you give is going to make it reflect on your ability. And people often underestimate to impress. I think a better way of expressing needs or requirements is to use the Goldilocks approach. Because uh, the research that was done by Jorgensen, where they took two sets of requirements document, in one set of requirements document, they put just enough information for the project. In the other, they put a lot of superfluous information. The project document that had a lot of superfluous information was estimated disproportionately higher. In other words, in your estimation meeting, if you happen to talk about baseball and the project, that project will get estimated higher because you're adding a lot of irrelevant information in that conversation. There goes your team spirit out of the window because you chose to do estimation in a meeting. Now, I'd like you to ask this question. Three months from now, you have to write your name on a white index card with a blue fountain pen. Who can give me an estimate? How long will it take you? From the point you started. Two seconds. Any other answer? An hour? Yeah, three months is when you started, right? So from the point you started. Now, I want you to pay a special attention to how your thinking process changes when I ask you to do that task now. What happens is when you add a time to a task, you add a gap that we are going to work on this project way into the future, humans think in abstract, positive, concrete steps that lead to progress. Whereas, when you ask for that same work to be done today, right here, right now, our thinking flips into concrete impediments to doing the work. Thoughts like, do I have an ink pen? Where was the last time I saw a white index card? Does it have to be ruled or does it have to be completely blank? These are questions that only occur when you're right there to do the work. In other words, just like in Agile, we do not advocate for big upfront design you should also not be doing big upfront estimating. It is unsafe to plan out a big giant release because the further out you're planning or estimating, the less likely is that you are going to be biased towards underestimating the project. A uh, remedy to it is to actually follow Agile, which is to have a product that is shippable at the end of every two months. Here's another example. <clears throat> An ellipse is more similar to a circle than a circle is to ellipse. But if I flip the comparison, now the circle is more similar to an octagon than it is to an ellipse. The order in which you are going to do relative estimation has an impact. Comparing A to B is not the same as comparing B to A. Well, I could not have planned this talk better, right? <laughs> uh, I think what, what uh, he just shared uh, is adding buffers is a way to deal with uncertainty. In this conference, they have 20 minutes of buffer between talks, which is unusual for a lot of conferences. Typically, they keep a 10 minute. So when you look at these buffers, if you don't use the buffer, it was a waste. Right? But if you use it, it was the best idea you ever had. <laughs> it's like insurance. Yes, yes, it is. Yes, it is. So I'm going to pick up at some point. Uh, here's a myth that we carry. Uh, and unfortunately, it's been propagated by a lot of books that people are better at relative estimation than absolute estimation. Uh, there is no research evidence behind it. It's a plausible answer because you could do a very simple misguided experiment, which one is bigger, and you all know this is bigger. But when there is an unknown unknown, how do you know? Yeah. So 
you could look at the Agile Alliance website where they kind of try to provide some guidance around this. It's a good practice because it exposes some degree of information when people try to guess how much complexity or risk or implementation effort is involved in this work. But it doesn't prove that we are better at it. What happens is when you compare A to B versus B to A, uh, you get different answers. And that's like even if I have a 10 product backlog, a backlog with 10 product backlog items, I can have so many different variances in the actual estimate of the entire backlog depending on the order in which I choose to estimate. Now, there is also a directional bias which I was talking about. Uh, there is also an assimilation effect. An eight-point story is not like eight one-point stories or a five-point story and a three-point story. Yeah, there's a, co a common misconception around it. One of the other research is the kind of sequence that you use to do your story pointing also has an effect on how people estimate. If you are using Fibonacci sequence, I can put at least $5 as a bet that most of your stories are an eight point stories, eight. Yeah, uh, the reason I can do that is because when you are working on an exponential scale, you. That announcement at zero information value. <laughs> See, that, that's what I'm trying to say. When you get into these discussions around estimation, if that discussion provides some valuable information, it was a worthy exercise. Otherwise, it's just a disruption to whatever we are doing. Uh, of course, that gentleman didn't know and he felt obliged to ask for like forgiveness, so we all forgive. <laughs> But when you have these exponential uh, estimation scale, you tend to find that people aggregate towards the middle of the range. And if you're using a modified Fibonacci or a Fibonacci, most people will estimate stuff at an eight. In fact, the research actually tells that you should use a linear scale, one, two, three, four, five, six, because that way you can actually get a better sense of a spread, right? So I have used Fibonacci sequence. I don't like blame it, but I'm also not in the camp that believes the entire universe can be explained by that series. Yeah. <clears throat> when people are aware that they did not finish the task, there is a memory reference bias. We are, as human beings, programmed to filter out bad memories and keep the good ones, because that's what keeps us going another day. Uh, this kind of a bias has been proven in cases of witness testimony. I mean, that was the most famous example of this, where people fill in gaps, and they put in a picture in their mind when what they actually saw was completely different than what they told people what they saw. So our memory of a very difficult project is filtered to only have the good parts or a majority of good parts. And when you look at another project, you're likely to forget the challenges that you had. Therefore, estimating the new project at a lower estimate, which is where uh, this uh, kind of bias kicks in. <laughs> You all see ABC, most of you. I know there are a few that are different. Now, for those who saw that as ABC are probably going through a little bit of cognitive dissonance, getting uncomfortable to accept the fact that it could also be 12, 13, and 14. And that's the challenge that I find primarily with estimation. In order to estimate, you must hypothesize a solution. And once you hypothesize a solution, even when by doing the work, you get new piece of information. You are now not cognitively ready to take or assimilate this information and form a new worldview of what the feature needs to be. Because I am so hooked on to what I thought it was that even when a new pattern emerges, I can't really accept it, or I will accept it reluctantly. This shows up as differences in opinion within the team members. Estimates predispose us to a solution. And this happens at the point when we know least about the solution and the least about how we are actually going to do this. This is something that I, 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 I theorize, right? Now, there is a lot of uncertainty in when and how. An example, like we don't know what benefit we are going to get when we deliver a particular feature, project, task, sorry, 
and we don't know how long it's going to take. So the possibilities of the spread of any of these points is fairly evenly distributed at this point. At this point, if I decide to ask for an estimate, I've eliminated all the benefit options that would occur if I had chosen to do the work instead, and I've incurred a negative cost because it takes effort and money for people to go do the work to provide you with an estimate. Now, if the actual time that it took or the cost of doing the estimate was higher than the actual benefit you got from doing the work, it's just bad business. Right? We've known projects where you've spent so much time estimating and then when you actually delivered the project, you didn't get any value out of that project. So all of that was a complete waste. On the other hand, if you believe in unicorns and I asked you to go saddle up my unicorn, and if you made the mistake of giving me an estimate, you are going to look for a unicorn at least up to the point you hit your estimate mark. And after that point, you're going to ask that, should we kind of still look for the unicorn or should we just go and say we were wrong? I am yet to find a single project that was canceled at the right moment. Most projects are canceled when it is already late, sometimes way too late. In hindsight, you know this should have been killed or not done, but you never know, like right now, this is the best time to kill the project because now is the best option to do it. It never happens. On the other hand, if you deliver early, I'll just explain this. If you actually deliver earlier than the tolerance zone, then there is a tendency to ask for more time because in many organizations, delivering a project early is as bad as delivering it late. Because if you deliver early next time around, your estimates or your guesses are going to be corrected for your early delivery. There's also a tendency to gold plate features, make them really better. If you had estimated the project or the task, to be around 10 units of time and you got it done in about seven, you're gonna use the three units of time to kind of make it nice and spiffy over processing of the work. What is happening is when you are working with an estimate and you have an organizational tolerance zone, if you miss the estimate mark, you start cutting corners in quality. You are also trying to create, I mean, it creates a domino effect where one project is late, which makes the next project late, and then every other project behind it is late. Yeah. What I hypothesize is when you have an estimate, you are creating a pinching effect on the benefit curve. You are concentrating the benefit to be in the estimation tolerance zone and asking for the least worst outcome, which is also the best outcome. So. Work with me. All right, that's a hack, right? <laughs> Good enough. <laughs> so when you constrain all of those outcomes over there, uh, you are guaranteeing a U-shaped curve, like an inverted U-shaped curve. That's, I think, the main reason why I keep frowning at the estimates. <laughs> you know, in an ideal world, uh, there would be no fear, there would be no judgment when people give estimates. There would be actual actuals, like you would actually collect the data at a fine degree of granularity. The only company that I know of where they have done this really, really well is uh, in Ann Arbor. This is Joy Inc., uh, the Sheridan, he wrote the book. Menlo. Thank you, ma'am. So Menlo, right? And they have 15 years of data using classic PMI project management technique for every single project that they have done at 15 minute time increments for every pair of developers. They use that as their classical reference information to cost or provide estimate to their customers. That's like a much more reliable technique. 
where you have actual actuals as opposed to never capturing your empirical data and keep on guessing the future and then getting frustrated that it doesn't deliver on time. So most of us don't work in this ideal world. There is a lot of uh, messiness in, in the reality. Yeah? And in our reality, if there is so much messiness, the question that I have to you is, are you going to go back to your teams or organizations and ask for estimates now that you know what you know? I don't know. I'm thinking about it now. It was just an open question for you to think about it. Yeah, no, I, I have to say, sometimes I ask for estimates too. It's not like it's illegal and even not go to jail. It, it's just that uh, the reason I ask for estimates is when I feel or when my team perceives that we will generate some new information that would be valuable, irrespective of whatever the estimate turned out to be. Yeah, so don't get attached too much to the number or the t-shirt size or the coffee cup size. Uh, that's immaterial. What is material is what did you discuss? And do you have any empirical data that can help you correct for your judgment biases that will always happen? Now, here's a tweet, and I'm providing you a lot of anecdotal evidence because I am not a researcher to go actually do research studies, and I don't have that inclination. So I collect data from the universe that supports my thinking, and then I tell it to you. <laughs> right? And I'm just as human as you are. So. <laughs> Here's what Martin Fowler says, like at first team struggle with estimation. And this tweet, it came out um, quite a few years ago, but this kind of re resonates with me in my own extreme programming team journey where we started to do some estimation and then we stopped doing it because there was not much value in doing that at all. We often mistake that estimation and the planning go together. There's a very famous book that is titled that way. And if you look at that book, uh, the amount of effort spent on estimation is minuscule compared to the time uh, the author spends in talking about planning. But you won't sell a book unless you write estimating on top of it. right? So that's my hypothesis. I think planning is completely different. Planning is about exposing risk. It's about reducing uncertainty, improving your decision making to provide information, to reveal options, and to improve the coordination between the team members. It's not about judging people. It's not about checking for competence. It's not about all the other fluff that goes around with estimation. Now, there are a few uh, misconceptions. And this uh, notion of story points has applicability in some contexts. But those contexts are very highly specialized context. If you have a fully cross-functional team, where you can take an idea all the way to delivery by a single team, and in scaled environments, this would mean a feature team, then you should do story points, because it's as good as anything else you're going to get. What I am trying to say is you should be able to deliver entire, the entire architectural stack and your process quality, the definition of done, which is you do your analysis, design, development, testing, all the way up to production. If I can put a story point on that within a single team, then those points are additive, which means this team does 21 points. So if I now have 110 points in my backlog, it's going to take me five to six sprints, because we have exercised the entire delivery cycle and the entire stack, and we do that every single day. Yeah? That was the context in which story points was being used. Now, if your context changes, where you start doing development story points, QA story points, then it misses the entire point. I mean, you're pointlessly pontificating about something that is useless. Yeah? <laughs> so an alternative to counting stories in this context, I think, if you have a good definition of done, you have the entire architectural stack, is to probably start with something much more simpler, which is just count the number of stories that are being done. Now, when you provide and use a measure, the cost of arriving at the measure should compensate, should be compensated by the value you're going to get from that. So if I can get similar information value by doing something really simple or heuristic, uh, why would I want to spend so much process and energy around coming up with something more complicated? 
So at least start capturing the count of stories and the story points if you're doing to see if there is any active correlation so you can let go of your story pointing habit. What I have found, the shift between story points to story counting is not significant. The only difference is instead of doing planning poker where you arrive at a story point, as a team you are now going to consciously focus on splitting larger sizes of work into smaller and smaller sizes of work. Everything else around your product backlog management still stays the same. You still need to agree on priority, you still need to get acceptance criteria, you still have to have a conversation around those stories, you still need a strong definition of done. You can still use the yesterday's weather techniques, something that you're already doing right now. The kicker in this approach is if teams are gonna game story points, they will inflate the story points, which is a dysfunction. You see, the metaphor that we work with is more is better. Yeah, more money is better, more joy is better. More pain is not better, but you see, the point in and of itself is a positive metaphor. In every game, every sport, throwing a three-pointer is better than doing a one-pointer because you get more points for your team. So more points is always better. So if you have the same psychological trigger where more stories are better, your teams are going to feed their own need by splitting the stories even further down. So even if they try to game the system, they game the system for the overall benefit. That's what you call as a positive loop, like a spiraling loop. The other one creates the yellow snowball effect. If, you're, if you know any Frank Zappa. <laughs> so in the real world, right, what we find is there is a lot, uh, the definition of done is very weak in most of the team situations. Sometimes uh, you have to rely on a manual QA because you're working with a large legacy team or oftentimes there is the marketing or the business analysis people who have to flesh out an idea and then it goes to the dev QA team. So there's always at least two queues that are working in sync. So they are serialized in other words. When you have these serialized queues, you're probably experiencing something like this, where new items come in, they go into a queue, a group of people work on it, then they put it into somebody else's queue and they work on it and finally you get a potentially shippable product increment. Now, whenever you do that, you are going to experience this cycle where you create a lot of features and functionality, you think you are done, and then you find out all the other issues because they have just finished their testing, so you now discover more work. Here's a trick you can play in any organization. Go ask them for a release date for a very important project. And that project needs to be way out into the future. So something like uh, 30th of January. Yeah? You ask them what's the date, they're gonna say 30th of January. You ask them what happens on 31st of January, they're gonna say no, no bad things happen, it is 30th of January. Right? Now go in the first week of January and ask them when are you going to ship. The response will change subtly to last week of January or first week of February. Yeah? Go another one week later and they're gonna say next week or the next week. Go again, it's gonna change uh, this week, this week, tomorrow, 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 this morning, this morning, this morning. Finally, when you actually ship is sometime in May. Because <laughs> you are going through this whiplash effect, you're oscillating. In any system, whenever you find an oscillation, you must expect that there is going to be a delay between that system. Whenever there is a delay, this slight delay here is going to create a whiplash effect on the actual delivery date and a disproportional whiplash effect. That's what we call as nonlinear systems in many cases. Now, here's what the principle says. Deliver working software frequently from a couple of weeks to a couple of months with a preference to the shorter time scale. So an agile team that does not have a potentially shippable product increment at least every two months is probably not doing agile, right? And, and as, as a, another touch on it, is any approach that recommends not having potentially shippable product increment every two months by definition is not agile. Now, <clears throat> Donald Reinertsen in his book Flow talks about that the most powerful way to reduce variability in your forecast is to shorten your planning horizons. This is a different way of expressing the same principle is get a deliverable product that you can ship 
or you create the option of being able to ship at least every two months, even at the cost of adding more features. In other words, my bias should be to have stable product increments at least every two months. If you have it daily, awesome, but at least every two months, that's my bias as opposed to adding more features and then not having that stability for my product. Here's one way you can start gathering uh, empirical data. There is a lot of, uh, there used to be a lot of buzz around stabilizing sprints, which actually is not uh, healthy. It is providing only half the information. If you do any stabilizing sprints, you should be calling every other sprint before that as a destabilizing sprint. <laughs> right? When your executives ask you what sprint you are in, uh, we are in destabilizing sprint number two. Right, because after that will come the stabilizing sprint. Because if you only say stabilizing sprint, then you are kind of making it sound nice. It's a marketing spin on it. Now, one way you can look at this is to say, how many destabilizing sprints do we have? And then how long does it take to stabilize my work? And that you can compare and put a dollar figure on it. In other words, if it takes you two sprints of work, new feature work, and then it takes you two more sprints to actually get it ready to ship to your customer, you're actually doing a two-month cycle. That's the amount of money you need to spend to get one month worth of idea out in the market or to your customers, right? That should be able to kind of provide a dollar number that says, if we don't fix our environment, if we don't take out the testing server from under the developer's desk, and put it in something that is more reliable, we are losing $500,000 every month. Can you fund $20,000 worth of uh, good hardware for us? That's a question and that's a metric that executives should be able to work with. Now, <clears throat> another challenge in the real world is around dependencies. And as usual, I have two laws of dependency management. One, don't create dependencies. Right, do whatever you can to not create dependencies. But if you must, then schedule dependent work only with the knowledge of dependent services pull schedule and expected cycle time. What I'm trying to say is don't order a pizza unless you know when the delivery time for that pizza is. You're only going to frustrate yourself and probably go home hungry. Right? That's why there is a good chain that a chain that makes it selling point that we have a service delivery expectation around it. Now, what happens in the real world, and this is something that started for me two years ago, was I was uh, working with a gaming company where they had highly specialized people, so game designers, service server engineers, audio engineers, uh, graphic artists, to tell them you should be a T-shaped individual it's not going to work. Yeah, because server engineers, you don't want to look at their sketches. And for the graphic engineers or the graphic designers, they don't do coding at all. So there's not any much transference of skills between these groups. And in this particular case, uh, the studio wanted to know, how is this going? Uh, do we have capacity to take this additional feature in our expansion? How will we get it done? And so on. And the response that they were getting from the individual teams was go look at the ALM tool that they had purchased. And the information they got from the ALM tool did not provide any, any like where are we at the higher level, because every team is giving their story points. The story points are not comparable. You cannot add apples to oranges, and I have no clue when and what we are actually going to ship. So what we looked at was uh, creating a very simple dependency board. For people who have tried to organize a dinner with your friends. If you only have one friend that you want to have dinner with, and you want to have dinner at 7, you're likely to tell them, let's have dinner at 7. Yeah? But if you're going to have dinner with 8 of your friends, you're going to tell them, let's have dinner at 6.30 and make a reservation for 7. Right? So it's the dinner at 7 principles. The more people have to synchronize, the more buffer you need to create. And that buffer does not come for free. As an organization, you have to pay and lock your capital to keep that buffer available for this particular team. So as a starting point, we started to visualize which teams are involved in delivery of this larger program. 
and what are the high-level epics. So a team that needed to be involved in every single epic is the most involved team, and the epic that required most teams to coordinate was the most at-risk epic. So if I want to prioritize impediments in this larger program, I want to make sure that team B is always supported. Any impediment that comes from team B is by definition number one priority because they are involved in so many different situations. And I want to schedule epic two much, much sooner than the rest of the epics because that has the most likelihood of going out because there are so many delay channels in it. What we do is, like in this case, like we created a big giant dependency board. You'll see there are certain pink cards or uh, pictures around it. Those, were, those teams had no involvement. That was their way of saying, we are not involved in this epic uh, development. <clears throat> when, as teams, you do estimation, especially if you are interconnected with a variety of teams in the same ecosystem, and if you're doing story pointing at the team level or any kind of estimation technique at the team level, you're ignoring the time uh, there is a delay between the work happening at team A and team B picking it up. So you're missing a big portion. It's almost like the guy who's looking for his ring under the lamp, right? Folks know this? Okay, I'll tell you, it's very short. Uh, this dude is drunk, he's uh, trying to look for a ring and he's looking in the middle of the night under a lamp. And then this other fellow walks up and he says, uh, can I help you? He's like, yeah, I lost my ring. So the, f the fellow starts to help him and they're looking and they're looking and they can't find it. So the fellow says, where did you lose the ring? And the guy says, over there in the dark. So why are you looking over here? Because that's where the light is. Yeah, that's what we do as organizations because where the light is on the teams, but that is not the problem. The problem area is where it is dark. That's where you lost the project because you are having so many delays. So trying to get better here is not going to yield any benefit. So try to focus on removing your delays between the different projects because that's going to give you the most bang for your buck. <clears throat> a approach or a graph that I find really helpful, it's a CFD diagram. In fact, there is a, a, a gentleman, uh, Larry Mascheron, I think. I can't pronounce his last name. He's going to do a talk uh, after this talk in one of the rooms where he's going to go over all of these, like the CFD diagrams and stuff. So if you don't know it, that would be a good talk to kind of just get basics down. But at simple, it has like two axes, epics or work and time. So when you look at the number of epics that you have to deliver, they show up on the vertical axis. And the work in progress shows up as the vertical axis. The items that have started and they are in progress versus the items that are now ready to be shipped. And the delay in this particular case, I'm trying to show there is team A and team B and the red zone is the delay that is happening between the two teams. So we want to try to reduce the delay as much as possible so you can actually have a much better predictable flow and you can use the CFD as a way to try to understand how much throughput we are getting and what is the right amount of work in progress that we need to have. <clears throat> so we want to optimize for the teams that, to reduce this. You see, actively managing the delay caused by the dependencies is the best way. A simpler approach to kind of begin to do that is to start prioritizing your epics or features or projects that you're doing and try to focus most of the teams to deliver an epic from start to end. The Kanban community calls it a start, stop starting, start finishing. Yeah? You can put a very explicit policy around only two or three epics will be in process in progress at any given point in time, but my work with most of the teams often yields not good results at first because the teams need to build some social uh, acceptance of an explicit whip limit. So to start it out as a very simple approach is you can start by asking the business to prioritize the epics and then ask for anyone to choose to work on that epic first. Over time, gradually, you can start putting in explicit whip limits at the entire program level. Now, whenever you find that there is a delay, there are backlog items. In other words, it's a, a delay is a lagging indicator, whereas a backlog or a number of items in your backlog is a leading indicator. 
If you see a long queue at the TSA, you expect to be late. You don't know how long every single item is going to take to be processed by, because everyone will have different situation. But if you see a long queue, then you know you're not going to get coffee and you might have to run to your plane. Yeah? That's a leading indicator. A longer queue means that you should be, you should, your, your project is going to be late. So a better way to manage projects is to start eliminating the queue size rather than trying to work on the delay itself. So work on the delay, but step one is to keep your queues really, really small. <laughs> oh, I, what I found uh, is to start putting explicit Kanban limits on the number of dependencies that you can create for any other team. Now this sounds very counterintuitive because when you look at it, everyone wants to go at full steam. And if the two teams are going at full steam, trying to be as productive as they can, they're actually going to slow the entire program down because they're creating new dependencies that are not being addressed. And this causes more work to be churning inside the team system because what I created is not yet integrated. And when team B starts working on it three months later, they find the interface is not good. Had I known that at the earliest, I would have solved the problem much better because my team has much less cost of context switching to understand what did we do three months ago, yeah? So, work on two stories. This is just a hypothetical situation. Uh, I have, from my work with most of my clients, have yet not to be able to implement an explicit Kanban limit. It's one of my hopes that I get to do that at some point. Uh, but there has been a lot of change in most of the organizations that we've worked with. Kind of want to share this uh, photo. This is a company that is trying to launch a completely new insurance company, like a, a new direct channel insurance company. This was their approach uh, of understanding when will we be ready to start selling insurance in the state of Illinois. And this was a classic, uh, come to the meeting, provide me with a date. It doesn't matter how you provide me with a date. So some agile teams will look at their product backlog, then they will do the story pointing, they will come to the date with an agile approach. The classic waterfall teams would go do the resource a date polling mechanism. When will you be done? And they will give a date and say, are you really sure that? Oh, no, no, if I work there, uh, it's much sooner. So you're collecting dates from people and based on that, you are color coding a particular project, epic or a feature as red, yellow or green, yeah? That's what is estimating driven planning is. But planning really is continuously planning and continuously looking at what else can be done. This is where they are at now took them about six months to kind of put this entire system in place where they are actively working on dependencies, actively minimizing the number of dependencies and focusing on delivering one epic at a time. I kind of wanted to give you a visual sense of how planning is so different than estimating and that's why I kind of chose those two pictures. Here's the kind of a summary of the whole Talk, and I think I'm now ready for some questions. I would like some guidance on how much time I have left. You have 10 minutes left. Perfect, I estimated it so well. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we can choose to use the buffer or not. It's up to us. I have provided, uh, I have used very heavy graphics, uh, so I have a slide share link that I shared with the, uh, with the conference folks. I, of course, will not be putting my clients' photos in the slide share. This is only for here, right? But there, most of the content is there, yeah. Yes. Yeah, when do they need it, right? No, I mean, if you look at what Agile provides as a guidance is uh, ask for the leadership, like when do you really need it? And you hope that they provide you with a real answer, yeah? And you focus on having shippable state every two months at least. Then you will shift the conversation from when will this be done 
to how much will be done. Because you are now building confidence in the organization that every two months, I, technically I'm ready to ship it. If I'm doing Scrum really well, which is actually I'm doing Scrum by the book, then I have my potentially shippable state every sprint. It could be two weeks, yeah? A lot of uh, the need for estimating goes away as you build capability into your teams. People ask estimates when the capability in our teams is very low because they are not comfortable with the variability and uncertainty an incapable team is able to provide. And I, want, I, I should rephrase myself. The, a team's competence is not isolated. It is also dependent on the organizational context around it. So you could take a team of really high performing, good, competent, technical people and put them in a very crappy environment and they would still not perform. Yeah. So it, the organization should look at it as it's it's larger problem as opposed to just one team's issue. I hope they can answer it. Yeah, thumbs up. All right. Yep. Right, right, right. Yeah, let me rephrase, like, just repeat, yeah. Uh, what you uh, expressed is uh, story points are not inherently bad, right? And uh, you could use story points and that could drive the team's behavior to split it into items, into smaller story pointed items, correct? And uh, also doing uh, story counting does the same, yeah? I think where I was going with that thing was, the applicability, the applicability of a story point or counting stories is only when your team is able to go through without, like go through the entire stack and meet the entire definition of that. Because then there is no delay. Yeah? If I have a delay in my system where I have a testing team, sorry, a development team and then a testing team, then estimating over here with story points is an inapplicable context it's also an inapplicable context for counting stories. Yeah? Now, the way I understand, most teams take a lot of time to come up with a story point estimate. So the effort spent in coming up with a story point is quite high, uh, but it's easier to just count the stories. So my thought process is, let me try something that is the simplest thing I could try. See if it gives me the benefit I'm looking for. If not, then I will add more complexity to my process. If that yields me the benefit, then I should do that practice. Yeah? Yes. Sometimes the estimates are actually for budgeting purposes. Mm -hmm. Right, right, right. Would you buy a TV if I sold you for a million dollars? No, so I did not tell you what TV you're gonna have, but you have a budget in your mind, right? So most organizations have an idea of how much is worth spending on this kind of a thing, yeah? You could bucket your budgets into saying we're gonna do 10% of our budget is going to be sustainment budget, 20% new feature, this is going to be exploratory work or whatever. And then be open to using the distribution of the portfolio wisely in those respective bu buckets. So that could be an alternative approach. The challenge is the traditional way of estimate, like budgeting, it relies on people coming up with how much you need first rather than questioning do you really need it. Am I making sense? Like, Yes, in, in some ways, right? If you have a particular project, you are seeking a particular outcome, how much is that outcome worth spending? 
Yeah? At some point you'd say, if I have to pay that much money for this outcome, I'm not going to do it. If it is this much money, I'll spend. So in classic or big organizations, you have an internal rate of return, right? Now, most business people will never put a dollar figure on the outcome, but they would still expect a dollar figure on the estimate. Right? So it's sort of like a weird game because they are allowed to deal with uncertainty while we are not. So if you could kind of build a bridge to saying it's the same level playing field, so let's guess together of how much it's worth and how much we should spend and trust us to spend that much money wisely and we will show you progress every two weeks. All you're saying is do Scrum and ship products, like get it shippable. I know, I, I kind of feel like I've done a disservice because I'm just doing hand waving, right? So maybe we should talk after, yeah? Yes. Oh, dude. I haven't really spent any brain cycle on it. It's the stupidest idea ever, so I'm like, <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't mean to offend people, but it just doesn't make sense, so why would I, sorry, I don't have an answer. It's not a polite, uh, friendly answer, so. <laughs> My mom said if you don't want to, don't say anything. It's good? All right, thank you guys.